Welcome back. Now, an international energy analyst says installed energy capacity in South Africa over the last five years has outpaced consumption and raises key questions about why the country finds itself in an energy crisis at all. That was one of the key takeaways in a discussion with an international energy policy advisor on the current power crisis gripping the country. Ignacio Fernandez is a senior advisor at the primary electricity supply company in South California, the most popular state in the United States and by itself the world's fifth largest economy. The state last year experienced rolling blackouts while Fernandez also worked in Chile's Ministry of Energy during that country's energy crisis in 2008. In conversation with the SABC's Sherwin Bryce piece, he makes a number of recommendations that includes a dramatic shift from coal over the longer term. Ignacio Fernandez, welcome to SABC News. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. So as South Africa struggles through a years-long and increasingly complex and debilitating energy crisis, California's energy crises uh, over the last two decades, most recently in 2020, are often cited as an example in South Africa that this is not unique to South Africa. What do you make of the South African example and what might we learn from how California in this instance or even perhaps the Chilean energy crisis in 2008, what can we learn from, from, from their approach to, to solving those crises there? I think the situation in Cal California, given the, the, the economic profile, the regulatory pattern the, in, and the legislation uh, in, in both uh, jurisdictions are fairly different, right? So um, if you look at one and the other, you would say there's nothing similar in here, only the results, meaning energy crisis, right? So, but you can take uh, uh, um, that narrative in inverted, right? What's so different and how can they come up to a similar result? Um, and in, in that point, I'm going to correct myself because I believe the results are somewhat different. You, uh, one, sitting at home and seeing uh, what you call load shed, uh, shedding, we call coordinated blackouts, um, they're the same result. But the origins and the way you manage them are fairly different. So in California, and I'm, I'm going to go for a couple of examples, California and Chile are two very different examples, but we can draw lessons from that. So in California, the situation is that we're transitioning from a fairly clean uh, a grid to an even cleaner grid. Uh, for example, in California, uh, there's no coal-fired power plants allowed right, for many years. And now we're trying to transition from natural gas into completely renewable uh, sources of energy. In this case of South Africa, it's very, very different, right? We know that approximately 90% of the power generation comes from coal-fired power plants, right? Now, the most significant, rather than the, than the sources of energy, differences is the, the, the electricity markets, how they run both in California and in South Africa. In, in California is absolutely uh, mostly uh, private, right? So we differentiate three types of uh, power generations. One is independent owned utilities, right? Completely private. The other ones are municipal or public owned utilities, which are in the hands of uh, municipalities, right? However, even though they're public, they are run as private companies, right? So that facilitates the, the work of the government on, uh, on setting their policies by sending market signals. And that's what it is, right? Uh, there are obviously some, some sticks, not only carrots, in the sense of like uh, the, the, the type of uh, um, pollution and emissions and energy efficiency levels and all of that, but it's mostly associated with uh, market mechanisms. In South Africa, given the, the power um, provider is, uh, the, I would say like 90% also is in the hands of the state, that deprives this, the, the government from sending any market signals because there's not much of a market there, right? So from that 
difference, um, it, we, it would impede for us to draw some uh, pot potential solutions. So privatization, is that what you're saying, is, is probably one of the key factors that needs to happen moving forward? I mean, the unions in South Africa are not going to like that. I'm not saying that privatization is the, is the, is the solution, right? Because uh, in California, uh, pretty much everything is, is private. In Chile, it's a lot more private than in the U.S., actually. Um, and in, in both jurisdictions, in both countries, we have the same situation. So I'm not saying that the privatizing the energy sector will solve that type of solution. What I'm saying is, if in the case of being private, um, in the case of like the energy sector being private, facilitates uh, energy uh, or market solution, market-based solutions for the government. So when the when South Africa is looking for examples outside, I would stay away from the ones that are purely market oriented. There's a, a report uh, on how California uh, in 2020, working with leading manufacturers and contractors, including General Electric, uh, took 42 days to install 430 megawatt aero derivative gas turbines to supplement the, the supply of, of uh, energy that was lost due to uh, plants going offline, uh, scorching temperatures, runaway fires and such. South Africans today are looking for a quick fix. They want to keep the lights on what can they do in the short term when you are confronting a situation that you have these type of shortages uh you can come up with patches right like what california did was a patch and in fact um a few days ago i was in a, in a hearing on how to get away from that patch so mm -hmm. uh, the understanding it was and and the money that was spent in that solution Everyone had clear that was a temporary situation, right? So from what I remember from years ago in South, South Africa has been having uh, these uh, load shedding situations from-, uh, from Since 2007. 2005, 2007, 2007 something like yeah. that. And every time uh, a patch has been put in place. So it's sort of like the old story of like, you see in the river, a baby floating. So you go and take it out and then another one, another one. And you don't spend enough time to look who's throwing those babies down up, uh, upstream, right? So it's the same situation. If we keep patching up what happens in, in, in the terms of like a, in, in energy, we call the, you know, the load consumption, the marginal load consumption, right? So in the next period, we're going to have an increase in, 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 in the consumption. So we are trying to affect that increase by putting a patch. You're never going to solve the interim, the, 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 the most important issue. Now, I did a quick analysis of, of the growth of the, of the installed capacity in South Africa, uh, and I found something last night that is kind of shocking and, and I'm looking at a graph where I can see and the data is from the International Energy Agency and the uh, Department of Energy in the US that the installed capacity proportionally in the last five years in South Africa has grown faster than the consumption. So one would ask why is this happening even though the, 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 the increase in the capacity is increasing. So I think, and in, in from all the articles that I, articles that I read, mm, very little, or I would say, I would dare to say none, uh, has addressed the issue of energy efficiency and demand response. Yeah, I've got so, a list here for you. It's, uh, you know, the reason they can't keep the lights on is because it's due to poor maintenance of power uh, stations that exist. They constantly have to be shut down for repairs, the slow completion of additional coal-powered right. stations that have yet to be brought online, the infrastructure right. deficits, corruption at ESCOM, the power utility, and the list goes on. Now, you talked a bit about how there are no coal-powered uh, stations in California, and we're having this big conversation in the context of COP26 that's happening in Glasgow and this transition away from fossil fuels. It's a big, fossil fuels, it's a big conversation in South Africa. What advice would you give them in that regard? Uh, I would say that, you know, um, when... Uh, the life gives you lemons, make lemonade. So this is a very good opportunity for South Africa to, you know, uh, uh, have a, you know, uh, a strike to the helm and, and go in a 
completely different direction, right? So on the one hand, and, and, and the point that I want to emphasize uh, on the terms of infrastructure, there's poor infrastructure for sure, but not just the generation, it's the transmission and distribution. And, the, and, and I would like to pay uh, closer attention to the, uh, the amount of losses on that end, also the amount of uh, loss opportunities on the consumption itself. So uh, industry is the primary con uh, a, a cons a consumer of electricity in South Africa, but there's no rules for how you consume that electricity. There's no rules about uh, um, uh, what we call MES, minimum uh, energy uh, performance standards, right? So that's something that you can address immediately. And the other, the, the other point you want to, to uh, embark uh, on, on, on the production, this is a golden opportunity for South Africa to address the international community, not necessarily by, 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 by uh, uh, direct financing, but on loans. Um, South Africa has a large amount of solar uh, radiation. Uh, there's a big uh, issue on, on, on there's a big potential for South Africa to increase uh, both solar and wind. And um, in the numbers I saw in South Africa are increasing, but they're still very marginal, very minimal. And, and, I, and I think there's a golden opportunity for South Africa to increase the renewable portfolio. And that can be done quickly. Obviously, there are economic implications when you have a discussion like this. I wonder how that informed, you know, the crisis in, in Chile in 2008 and, and, and more recently in California. How does that economic imperative influence some of the policy decision making uh, behind closed doors? Yeah, from that, I would say the parallel is closer to what happened in Chile back in 2008. We had a, a very broad uh, energy crisis because we had uh, uh, um, an agreement with, the, with Argentina to supply us with natural gas. And all of a sudden, because of the internal situation in Argentina, they had to cut uh, that supply of natural gas to Chile from one day to the, to the next, right? So we very quickly, within two or three months, the government in Chile had to, um, had to uh, come up with a solution, both on the supply and also on the demand, right? So on the demand side, the, the, there was an incredible energy efficiency campaign. Uh, at the residential level, um, which, by the way, that's a, a, a very good uh, hint. Residential uh, universal is usually 15% of the energy, the electricity consumption, right? Only 15%, but it's very flexible. You can cut down the uh, residential uh, uh, electric electricity consumption very rapidly just by changing behavior, you know, and there's a uh, uh, the, the campaign was like to change the light bulbs or turn off the light bulbs and et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, what we did uh, at that point was like calculate what was going to be the economic impact to the society if we had to come up with brownouts or uh, uh, load shedding. And with that marginal cost, we said, okay, so we have to take that amount of money and put it into both of uh, uh, consumption reduction, right? And also a, 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 a quick uh, elements of, uh, of supply. So what we did, we installed in a matter of months, uh, we made uh, quick contracts in, in to, with LNGs, with uh, liquefied natural gas plants on the ports, meaning there's a very vast uh, um, a, a market of liquefied natural gas uh, boats going all over the place, and you can hook them up and very quickly uh, uh, supply. It's not cheap, but it was cheaper than losing the amount of electricity, uh, the, sorry, losing the production that we would have lost if the electricity wasn't provided uh, effectively. You know, at the beginning of this conversation, you talked about how you know, it's difficult to make comparisons because each situation is essentially unique. As you correctly point out, South Africa's electricity supply is dependent on, in large part, on coal-powered stations. Talk about what the future looks like here, right? I mean, we're moving away from fossil fuels. Uh, there's a great deal of talk about the right energy mix. What does the right energy mix perhaps look for, uh, like for a country like South Africa? Well, um, I would say, I mean... Uh we're doing a quick analysis of the of the portfolio and the potential uh, South Africa, I mean, has 
um, a, a great potential on wind and solar energy for sure. Now, that's not 24 seven type of uh, energy production, right? So you have to look into storage and that gets a little bit more expensive. But, um, but the way I would think uh, uh, very humbly, uh, I would approach the situation in South Africa, um, which many countries have done around the world. Uh, we always, we historically look at energy production or on a base load provided by fossil fuels and using renewables to peak, basically to go on top of that base load. Why don't we flip it, right? So power as much as possible, mass as we can from solar and wind, which by the way, once it's constructed, the uh, operation maintenance is close to zero. So once it's been paid for, the electricity is extremely cheap. And on those valleys or that production uh, that is needed to peak, then you can power uh, with coal fire power plants or natural gas. Pretty much what we saw in the UK recently, right? They had a, a deficit and they uh, fired up the coal powered stations. Final question for you. I want to end with this. How do you manage public expectations? You have a very irate, angry, frustrated public that is demanding answers, calling for people to resign. Uh, they want the lights on. I mean, this is affecting small businesses, large businesses like mining. Uh, what's your advice on how to manage public expectations, given your experiences in Chile? Yes, unfortunately, the answer for that is final results, right? You cannot come up with a number of, uh, of uh, you mean, if, if you work very hard and you do all these contracts and in the end end up that you have to do load shedding, uh, you know, excuses are not good reasons, right? So um, uh, the our approach in Chile was like, you have to keep the lights on no matter what, right? And uh, and the advantage in the in, 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 uh, that the government of South Africa, uh, because it's a it's, it's a blessing, it's a curse that they the 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 they they control all the uh, the power supply. So take that advantage. So if you go on a quick rampage, rampage to install uh, a solar capacity, uh, to increase the solar capacity and wind capacity, but those results will not come up for the next two, three years. What can come up really quick is a quick demand response management. What we did, but because Chile was, uh, or Chile is uh, uh, a natural resource uh, pro uh, uh, productive country like South Africa. Similar to South Africa, one, yeah. Yeah, with the number one producer of copper, we talked to the uh, copper producers and said, what is the possibility of you, first of all, improving your energy efficiency of your production? And if you need to change your, your, your capital investment, we can give you a break on that, right? We can give you a break and facilitate uh, your change of equipment very quickly. And also lowering your production of, uh, at certain hours, you know, because we're going to be managing managing that demand. That ended up being uh, a very quick. It doesn't fluctuate the needle that much, but it was good enough in order not to come up with load shedding um, situations. So you have to have the long term solution with quick uh, uh, short term solutions at the same time. Always so I'll, in mind. I'll tell you what the quote of the interview is. Excuses are not a good reason. Ignacio, thank you so very much indeed. Thank you very much for having me. Ignacio Fernandez is a climate and energy policy analyst with 20 years experience, mostly at the international level and currently a senior advisor at Southern California Edison, the primary electricity supply company for much of Southern California. Thanks again. Thank you.